Welcome to this episode of the Million Dollar Mastermind. I'm Larry Wydell, and before we get started, if you want to know exactly how to win again and again, go to wydellonwinning.com forward slash webinar now to watch something I've put together for you. Now let's get going into this episode of Million Dollar Mastermind. I am with John Paul Campanegro, one of the most renowned photographers in the world today. And the great thing about John is not only does he have an incredibly wide and uh, super high quality uh, and intriguing uh, body of work, he also is every bit as energetic and uh, uh, organized about helping applies across the board to being useful in all areas of life because the creative process is, is what we're doing. You know, your, your life is an artwork and uh, uh, you get to be, you know, you're the artist in your life. And so I wanted to explore that with you, John. I've got, a, I've got something to put in front of you, but welcome back. <laughs> Thank you for having me back. That's great. That's great. Hey, you, here's what I wanted to put, put on the table. They, I saw a documentary, or maybe two or three of them recently, about it's one of the most fascinating things of our time creatively is the rebuilding of uh, uh, Notre Dame. Mm, yeah, after the and, fire. Yeah, and they, they documented, you know, after the fire. Mm. And they went in and they had to go back and explore how, this, how they built this sucker, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and... You know, and they went back and opened up the whole subject that the great cathedrals, all these great uh, uh, pieces of architecture, this staggering that, you know, they came up with the, the, uh, the, the flying buttresses, and flying buttresses and how they, they, they had to invent all of these things. Like with the Colosseum, they had to invent uh, concrete and had to invent bricks with the Colosseum, yeah. you know. And had to figure out the water where they, 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 the water supply from the mountains hundreds of miles away, you know. And uh, in guess what? There was no architecture schools back then. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you yeah. think, when you think, you know, when you realize it was the tradesmen who figured out flying buttresses. It was the guys on the job busting their rear who were, you know, lifetime probably generations of uh, people in metalworking and woodworking and, and glass work and things like that came up with like, well, here's what we want, you know, and these, these vaulted ceilings that are just staggering today to yeah. pull off. They did it with like wood. <laughs> it's like, who were these people, you know, and where do they come from? But they, it's important for people to know, you know, it's encouraging that like you can build cathedrals in your life uh, yourself. If you're willing to get in there and bust your rear and, and, <laughs> and put a, put a team together of people who are excited about following you and excited about the project you're doing. And maybe they don't have that same drive and everything, but they want to be a part, you know, it's like, you can't go out and win a national championship all by yourself, but you can be on a team and you can make a contribution to a team that wins a national championship. So you, you can't build a cathedral all by yourself, but you, <laughs> you know, but you can have, you know, the glass work, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the woodwork, the stained glass. Uh, and so the, the floor tiles and all of that stuff. So the deal is that uh, when it comes you know, we didn't have school. You didn't have to have a master's in architecture to do all of this. stuff. There were no schools like that, but they got done anyway. And a lot of these things have never been matched. You know, it's like they're just now trying to figure out how these obelisks got built uh, in. And I, I don't know how they took them down. Like there's supposedly there's one court in uh, Egypt where there were 11 of these huge hundred uh, foot tall uh, obelisks there, but now they took them down and then they hauled them around the world. You know, yeah. like in Paris yeah. and then Berlin, and yeah. it's like, how do they take these things? Down? Yeah, you know, a lot of it gets passed forward, but some of it remains a mystery. Like 
they, it's, the Mayan or Incan stonework where you can you can't put a, push a piece of paper between these two huge blocks of stone that the yeah the, so tight it's amazing amazing it, engineering absolutely so, amazing but the lesson there's a lesson there for us in that we don't have to go and get certificates in uh, you know a permission to you know like Zuckerman did not get uh, a degree in social media before he created Facebook. Because <laughs> he created social yeah, media. Yeah, yeah, he created. <laughs> you know, right. I That's was the to, ultimate degree, yeah. I guess. Uh, uh, you know, I was with. Uh, we we had a convention down in Atlanta and uh, in the in the big dome there, and the CNN headquarters is right next door. And I was inside many years ago. I was inside waiting at the elevator and there was Ted Turner. Ted Turner and that was when he had, uh, uh, what's her name? Jane Fonda. Uh, they were they were the hot couple. Yeah. And, and, and he was talking to her while they're waiting for the elevator. And he said, you know, he said, I'm not qualified to do any job in this building. Or with this company, <laughs> he said. I he said I couldn't get a job here, and he said. But fortunately, he said I own the company, so I don't need it. <laughs> exactly. And, and and then he said, I do not have the money it would take to buy a building like this. Hmm. But he said, um, but fortunately, he said I built it, so I don't have to do that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> and so. There's a lot to be said for just getting on with the big dream because you and I both, like if you look at what you've been able to accomplish in your life so far, uh, uh, is so many of us, when we have success, we go so far beyond what we had in our mind. Uh, it's just, you know, we had to work hard and we did all that stuff, but we would have worked around the clock if we knew how good it was going to be, you know? And so, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, yeah. I didn't know I was working for this. I mean, you know, I can't, yeah. even, I can't even remember the bad times hardly now. In fact, it is hard to get a lot of the super successful people to really talk in depth about their bad times because on this side of the, the mountain, uh, the payoff is so staggering where, the yeah. price was staggering early on, you know, the price right. price of dealing with setbacks and defeats and people putting you down and yeah. demeaning you and ignoring you and making condescending comments. And then you work hard forever and you don't get a result, you know, just like when we all try to lose weight, you know, it's just so depressing, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, we have, even harder yeah. for a corporation to lose yeah. weight. Yeah. Even co harder for a corporation. Yeah. But, uh, you know, when you get out there and you see how great it is now, did you have any idea the payoff would be there? No, no. Um, I had certain qualities that I wanted to have in my life, certain larger, more abstract goals that have been realized. But the specifics of it, I had no idea. Uh, you know, if you told me in the 1980s when I was in college, that I'd be doing what I'm doing today. I'd say, where's your little jacket? You know, the white one that keeps yeah. your arms behind your back. Right. You know, so you're going to be, you're going to be doing digital imaging. What's that? It didn't exist. Yeah. And, and you're going to be running workshops down to places like Antarctica. No way. Yeah. <laughs> you know? right. yeah. And it just, you know, you just keep on going. Oh, your yeah. iPhone's going to be in the Smithsonian. What? Yeah. Wasn't yeah. even on the list. It's just a nice little addition there. Right. Um, other things happen along the way. And um, once again, we come back to this notion of process. You, uh, you find your path by, by, by walking it. You, you start with a few steps and eventually it develops into a longer road. You try and keep yourself going in the direction you most wanted to go, but it's, it's going to unfold a little differently. And there's so much to learn about its unfolding we learn not only about the path, but also about ourselves and how we want to uh, travel it, to get more out of our lives and make sure that we're going in the right directions. And, and ultimately we feel better about our achievements because they're truly ours. We're not making those achievements for somebody else. We've defined success and our goals for ourselves. And when we arrive there, 
uh, it feels so good because it's like when I make an artwork, it's like I made this, you know, and most of us have had that feeling, you know, when we were like three or four or five, right. you know, you show your drawing to your mom, say, look, yeah. mom, I made this. Yeah. You know, like, look, mom, no hands. Yeah. <laughs> you know, on the bicycle, right. Right? Like I did this. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think when you're talking about those successful people who are looking back, they have that, that wonderful feeling and that grounding of having succeeded on their terms. And then the rest is icing on the cake. So it is easy to overlook the, the hard times where you haven't quite found what you're looking for. The conditions are not quite right. Um, you still know you've got a lot of hard work to go. Uh, uh, and I'm not sure why the hard work back in the early days when, when your vision isn't as clear, when you haven't accomplished as much, when your successes are somebody else's and not your own, um, why, why that's so much more challenging. Because you know when you do finally succeed, you kind of get addicted to that high and you still want to work. I mean, the notion that I would want to retire, I mean, there's, sir, there's parts of my business I don't want to have to run 10 years from now or even three, but I don't ever want to stop making images. Right? The, the secret job. doing that the rest of my life because I love it so much. And this, I want to work at it hard because I know it's more rewarding, more fulfilling, and I grow. Yeah. Well, the secret is, John, that you can retire from the boring, annoying parts and get yeah. hire. You know, if you're success, you know, you can become a surgeon and hire nurses. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> you can, you can yeah. be, if you're successful enough, you can get people to drag the patients in, clean them up, yeah. get them all ready and say, you don't even have to reach with a scalpel. You know, I mean, you can yeah. make you so start thinking creatively and make that plan, make it happen. Right. You know, get the head. The more successful you are, the more you can add the support team around you and not just have people, but have them excerpts. Like with our, our staff, I, I said, I don't just have a staff. I've got a trophy staff. I don't have an all, <laughs> I don't have an all-star staff. They, they wouldn't last in our world. You know, I got to have a trophy staff. And so uh, when you, as you were starting out, what was the hardest thing for you to get yourself to do that that would be you look back and it felt at the time as a grind that you know if i'm going to get where i want to go i got to do these things i really don't want to do it and uh you know for a lot of independent businessmen it's looking at the books and keeping up with the numbers yeah. and you know paying attention to the details rather than just trust somebody else and then they wind up robbing you blind which happens to a lot of us you know yes and, it does yeah, yeah. hey Listen, there's a lot of information online, but there aren't a lot of people who have actually done something. In my case, I've actually built a successful business that's accrued over $5 billion in assets under management and has done well even during trying times. Now, if you want to know exactly how I've done this, go to whiteellenwinning.com forward slash webinar now. I've compressed a decade of learning into five short weeks just for those of you who want to give yourself an incredible advantage and are tired of waiting and watching others move up. I think one of the big resistances for me as a visual artist was uh, not wanting to talk or write about my work to use words. And in some ways, my community uh, stigmatizes artists who are articulate because, uh, well, then they're writers or they're really more good at business than they are about making the art. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Okay. But while I resisted writing my first artist statement, when I finally finished it, it, it was a process that I engaged and I learned a great deal about myself, my vision and where I was going simply yeah. by writing that one or two pages. Mm -hmm. And it, it was, there was a little bit of external validation and it was just external when one of the uh, professors at Stanford uh, said, Hey, do you mind if I read this to my class? You know, so wow. it's, a good, it's a good example of like an artist statement. It was my first. And I, I kind of got a taste for how I could grow by getting clear with words about what I was doing and where I wanted to go. And you don't have to write an artist statement for this. This could be a business plan. This could be a mission statement. This could be the elevator pitch that you use either when you're going up in a, an elevator or when you show up on a cocktail party at, an, at a gallery exhibit or whatever it is. So what do you do? Well, I'm an environmental artist. I, I work in, vir I, I make mm -hmm. land art in virtual space. What, what is yeah. that? Tell me yeah. more. Conversation starter, right? Right. So words can be tremendously helpful. 
uh, and, and I resisted them. You know? What what was your driest spell? How did you keep yourself going through your driest spell? When it was like, you know, we all reach, you know, it's not all uh, uh, a nice simple climb to the top you know it's uh there's there's valleys and then some of the valleys are worse than others sometimes you cause them sometimes usually it's you know it, it can be the political situation it could be the economic situation could be personal things financial things you know you make commitments and then the funds don't come in uh right right so, so, so i think there's there's many kinds of dry spells let's let's work from the present back okay um this year, 2020, the past year, thank goodness. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, hopefully, uh, yeah. You know, I've been grounded. I got back from Antarctica in February and uh, everything got shut down and I haven't been able to travel. Uh, people haven't been able to come in and take my workshops. Uh, my, my income has shrunk, you know, pretty yeah. dramatically and you just kind of have to weather that. But this great pause has been one of the most creative periods of my life. I've made over 200 images. I've written three books of poetry, a quarter book of a nonfiction book. I pulled my gallery talks online, so I'm improving my website. More importantly, I kind of filled my tank up. I, I'd been giving so much to other people that I needed to do this personal work to energize myself because right. when, when you're doing the thing you really love, you get off on it. It fills you yeah. up with energy. You know, if yeah. you can see it in a performer. You can see it in yourself. When you're doing the things you love, you feel energized. It is work. So I'm right. sure you, you, you know, there's a difference between grinding for somebody else. Right. And having put in a really long work week, month, right. year, mm -hmm. yeah. but you're, you're still fulfilled by the work that you're doing. That's, yeah. that's a different thing. So you know, sir, there's been a financial dry spell this year, but in terms of the time that it's given me, it's been one of the best gifts that I've been given my entire life. Well, people say, who motivates the motivator? And, you know, there are, I'm sure you have people that you uh, plug into, friends that inspire you, things that inspire you, but most of the time, it's the motivator that inspires the motivator because Absolutely. the motivated is, the motivator is working on things that fires himself or herself up. Right. And, getting closer to then learning more about that and you know that that just creates the uh the furnace you know that they keep that that fire burning but uh you know, this is so there have been creative dry spells as well let's let's wind it back 10 15 plus years ago when i've got too many people working for me and i'm trying to make salary and i'm doing all of these other things that's busy work for me uh, but I'm not putting in the time that I want to create the things I want to do, nor am I putting my energy into the things that challenge me and keep me alive to it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking at burnout. You know, yeah. it's like, mm, this is not going where I'm going. I'm not filling my tank. I'm, I'm on this treadmill. It's not yeah. working for me. Yeah. So luckily I'm self-employed and I've always said you need to be as creative with your business as you are with your art. You know, that applies to life. Right. Um, so if, if it's not working for you now, where do you want to go? Let's reverse engineer where you want to go. Set the vision and then take the steps back. What's the first step you need to take now to move towards that goal? And of course, stay open and flexible to it. So there've been many times where I've shifted from teaching digital printmaking and I feel like I'm also can teach something out in the field on location, uh, not just be behind the computer. Yeah. Uh, so let's shift the brand a little bit. Let's... Uh, write some more articles, let's offer some workshops yourselves. Well, suddenly I've got my own workshop program instead of teaching for everybody else. Yeah. And it lets me go out and make opportunities. Like, am I going to have to get an NEA grant like Elliot Porter did to go down to Antarctica? How long is that going to take? You yeah. Know, for real composites, good luck. Yeah. You no, know, I developed my own workshop program and I partnered with a wonderful guy, Seth Resnick. You know yeah. Seth well. He's appeared yeah. here. Said, mm -hmm. hey, let's make this thing work because we want to yeah. go back there. And yeah. we did. So now 2022, we're going to go back for the 13th time yeah. and make those opportunities happen. But it doesn't happen if you don't set the vision. In fact, the very first trip to Antarctica, I always wanted to go to Antarctica the minute I saw Elliot Porter in his late 70s, early 80s. He came back doing his uh, project, Antarctica. My mom designed the book. The minute I saw that, I wanted to go, but very few people were going. There were no tourist ships. You had to get on a, a National Science Foundation vessel, that kind of thing. You had to get right. special permission. 
-hmm. I wanted to go. I didn't know how that was going to happen. Well, there was a period of time in my life where things really got shaken up and I just, I reviewed everything and I set my bucket list and I looked at all the locations and I put Antarctica right at the top of that list. Six weeks later, my colleague, Michael Reichman calls up and says, Hey JP, do you want to teach a workshop with me in Antarctica? <laughs> I, I didn't even have to reach out for it. Yeah. Somebody came to me, but I set the intention very clearly. Right. I think um, uh, Jim Carrey talks about this quite a lot. He wrote himself a million dollar check. Right. And put it on the wall because he says, yeah. I need to earn my first million. That, that yeah. sense of visualization, where do you want to go? Being right. clear about that. And then being open enough and flexible enough that, you know, when it swims by, you can catch it. Yeah. Yeah. You got to this thing about speaking into existence. I mean, you can go, you can go too far with that, but at least it turns your mind on like, okay, notice these things. Notice the <laughs> Notice the thing, pay attention to the things that's going to get me there, if at all possible. Wake up inside, hear, hear brain cells, this yeah. is, what, you know, fetch, you know, it's like <laughs> the dog is not going to run out in the field unless you throw the, the bone of the ball out there first, you know, <laughs> but that, that's what you it is. write about it, you can take it too far, you can say, I want to play with the dog, I want to play with the dog, play. <laughs> throw the darn ball already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the dog's jumping up and down to throw the ball yeah <laughs> like that old joke you know in the flood and they're praying for you know god right. save yeah. us and the helicopter yeah. comes by they won't get on it <laughs> right yeah <laughs> early yeah. game like, right. that's your helicopter <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> stay flexible stay open stay, yeah Just keep in mysterious ways uh, yes yes that's great stuff thanks so much john and uh look forward to the next time we can get together I look forward to too. If you enjoyed what you've heard and are dead serious about finding out for yourself exactly how this works in the real world, I've taken the most valuable business lessons I've learned over 40 years and put them into something for you to watch. Go to whiteellenwinning.com forward slash webinar now in order to move up as fast as possible. I'm Larry Whitell and I run the Million Dollar Mastermind. Go, go, go.